Man, you guys, I'll tell you, this election, choosing between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, I, I know it's important. I know voting, you got to vote, you know, I know all that stuff, but just sometimes it feels like being stuck, you know, between these two options, boxed in, like between the devil and the deep blue sea, or, or between the, a rock and a hard place. Or it's like, you know, it's like if you were traveling on the ocean and you came to this narrow pass and on one side there was an enormous whirlpool that just sucked everything down underneath it. And then on the other side there was this hideous beast creature with ravenous heads that just craved to devour human flesh. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like that, you know, like if only there were some sort of easy phrase I could use to describe that sort of situation. You know, some quick and easy way I could talk about that. Now eh, maybe it'll come to me. It's Scylla and Charybdis, that's the phrase. That's the OG go-to descriptor for choosing between two bad options. It's an episode on Odysseus' journey that has become so famous that it's its own catchphrase, its own buzzword, its own bumper sticker. When you say, I'm choosing stuck between Scylla and Charybdis, you mean you only have bad options. There are no good choices in front of you, so you just have to pick the least bad possibility. And that's what Odysseus has to face here on what is effectively the last leg of his journey. We're up to book 12 now, and Odysseus has been telling his story to the Phaeacians, to King Alcinous and his merry band of utopians in, in the, uh, on the island of Scaria. And now we've come, I said last week that the conversation with the uh, souls in Hades, the sort of entry into the realm of the dead, was Odysseus' lowest point. And I think that's true in a sense. That's when he faces his deepest fears, the most existential questions that face any hero journeying back from war, any veteran. But now he still has a gauntlet to go through. And in some ways, this is about rebuilding, building himself back up into a new man, having passed through the nothing, having passed through Erebus, the land of darkness. It's a question what kind of man he's going to become, and there are still trials and, and terrible tragedies facing him. He's been through many tribulations, many sorrows. He is polutletos, much enduring, and yet he still has a lot to go. And this whole episode, this whole series of episodes, Scylla and Charybdis is nested into a larger part of his journey that is all about trade-offs. And trade-offs are something I've actually talked about a lot on the show. I have occasion often to refer back to Thomas Sowell, the, one of the great, genuinely one of the great intellects of our times, and also one of the great American intellects in that he's a plain-spoken kind of writer, and he is really good at reducing deep truths to simple, straightforward principles, one of which is everything is a trade-off. You're always picking between different possibilities and you always lose something for everything you gain, even when you make a good choice. Part of the tragedy, part of the difficulty of human life is that even when, let's say, you get married and you marry the right person and it's joyful and happy, we tend, I think, to live in a fantasy land where that means that because you made a good choice and because you're happy, there's no regrets. We have even the saying, no regrets, right? You've heard maybe the song, I don't regret anything, is an old French song. Non, rien de rien, je ne regrette rien. This is Edith Piaf, one of the great French uh, chanteuses, balladeers, sings about how she regrets nothing. And this idea of having no regrets is also part of the American idiom of, of jazz songs. I did it my way, right? When there was doubt, I ate it up and spat it out. And there's something a little bit naive about this. There's something, of course, charming, but also it denies a reality, which is that every one of us lives with regrets, even happy people who live good lives, who are virtuous, live with regrets. And it's actually part of being honest to acknowledge that, to be able to talk about that openly because it enables you to make better choices. A lot of our politics right now, a lot of the problem with our politics has to do with denying the reality of trade-offs. You get people proposing like, oh, we're going to have unlimited health care. The government's going to pay for health care. And so you can't 
talk about the fact that that's a trade-off. That's some taxpayer, some person who is paying for universal health care. And, and that's, that kind of thinking is what enables you to get into these utopian ideas, these fantasies about, yeah, well, why can't we have a million immigrants and uh, unlimited health care and all this other stuff? Well, because certain things bring costs with them. And, and some costs are heavier to pay than others. And we're never just aiming for that perfect happy ending where nothing is bad and we have no regrets. That's not a real thing. What we're aiming for is good trade-offs, the best option in front of us, given who we are, where we stand, what we value and desire, and what is objectively good. And that navigation is just all of life is about that. So I've talked about this before sometimes when you guys ask me advice about things like how do I start reading practice, one of the things I say is it's a trade-off. You're going to get huge value out of reading texts like the Odyssey, out of incorporating even just 30 minutes a day into your life of reading Homer and the great poets or any really book at all, but certainly great Western literature, you're going to get an enormous amount out of that. But that doesn't mean you're not going to give stuff up. You are. You only have so many hours in a day. You're going to give up watching Netflix. Or you're going to give up scrolling Twitter or something else. You know, I think it's that's a good trade-off because you actually you shake off some stuff that might be bad for you. You get some stuff that's definitely good for you, but you also lose certain things, certain pleasures. And the whole way of understanding life, I think, is to know that, yeah, you, you, it's not like there's not good in the stuff you're doing that you, you want to stop. Like if you're scrolling Twitter, you're obviously getting something out of that, some connection, communication, information. And, and the point of stopping that, the point of giving something up, even if it's fasting or if it's stopping Twitter or if you're doing something for Lent or whatever, the point is not the giving up. The point is not the no, the point is not the suffering. It's very easy to get into a position in your head where the suffering is the point, and that's the virtue. And so suffering becomes identical to virtue. But suffering is just a pathway to virtue. Giving something up is a route to getting something more. And that's what Jesus takes the Pharisees to task about. He says, you, fa you go fasting and you paint your face or you, you cry and you wear your black clothes and you show how sorrow how sorrowful, how painful it is. And that's what you think this is about. But you, others, when you fast, wash your face, smile, right? Like, be joyful. Why? Because your fasting is a route to a better communion with God and you should actually be about joy. You should be about more goodness. So, this principle goes very, very deep into the world that everything is trade-offs. And because Homer was a profound artist, he found a way to confront Odysseus with this. I mean, in some ways, it's been part of his journey the whole time. He's had to give up. I've talked about these alternate lives he has to give up on the way to going home. He has to give up other women. He has to give up substance abuse and addiction and just pure oblivion and forgetfulness on the island of the Lotus Eaters. All these things that a soldier coming home from war might choose and still might choose. Suicide even. He has to consider that, look at that and decide no, even a suffering life is better than no life, is better than ending my life. And now that he's made that decision, his choice becomes slightly different. It's less about what am I not going to do and more about who am I going to be. And that's an important turning point. We're really kind of in the middle of the poem. There's 24 books to the Iliad and the Odyssey. We're in book 12. So if you're a math expert like me, you can perform some quick calculations in your head and realize that book 12 is halfway through the Odyssey. So we're at a turning point, and we're at a turning point that Homer has very, very carefully engineered. I always want to stress that when we come up on something like that, because there are so many people that think this poem was thrown together by accident or that it kind of evolved randomly out of different singers playing off of each other. I'm, I'm open very much to the idea that there were other singers that contributed ideas and that Homer was part of a communion of, of musicians who, who were composing around the 700s BC or so. But I also think that at some point in the process of composing these poems, you have to believe that somebody some one thinker brought the whole thing together, stitched it all together. It's too carefully constructed not to believe that. And this is a prime example. We have just gone through 
the ultimate existential question, should I live or should I die? What is it to die? What is it to live? Odysseus has chosen to live, to move forward in this very painful way toward home and to make the ultimate trade-off of everything else for commitment to home and to family, which is going to give him back every bit as much as he gives up for it. It is ultimately going to be a good trade-off that he is making, but now he has to reconstruct his personality, essentially, and learn to be a man that can be trusted and that can trust others. And I really think that's what this gauntlet is all about. It's a tragic book. 12 is a tragic book. It might be the saddest book in the Odyssey because it's about learning these lessons too late. And there are regrets, deep regrets in this. And there are also intractable problems, suffering that can't be avoided. But indeed, there are also things that Odysseus could have avoided, problems that he also creates, or at least ways that he fails as a leader, I think, in this book that he's going to have to think about and process all through the rest of his journey. So, like I said, we left him last uh, in the land beyond the ocean. So not actually in the underworld, but he was drawing up the spirits from the dark to, to come and, and speak with him by offering them blood and, and so forth. And now he's coming back to, once again, I have the opportunity to say my favorite word in the whole poem, Ia, which is Circe's island. He actually returns back to talk to Circe again now that he's gotten the prophecy from Tiresias. And she is now an ally, so she's been, I mean, tamed is sort of a, a crude way of putting it, but she has been effectively enlisted to their side. They've proven their worth, Odysseus has proven his worth, and since he's proven his worth as a man, she also now honors him as a, as a woman. She dresses up to meet them, they throw a party, but in the midst of this party, after they've dealt with the problem of Elpinor, who, who died, you remember, on, on the island, and they have to give him a good burial, Circe pulls Odysseus aside and talks to him in private and tells him what's up ahead because he has a big picture idea. He knows that he has to keep his crew from eating the cattle of the sun. And that is his major objective that will make the difference between getting home with some of his men versus getting home in a bad way. Kakos, there's something terrible that will happen. He may still get home even if he eats, even if his crew eats the cattle of the sun, kills the cattle of the sun, but he knows that there's a big trial up ahead at the end, near the end of this journey. He doesn't really know what's, what's in the way in between, or at least there's a lot of open possibilities for how he might get there. Circe is going to tell him in private that many, many hard choices now await him. So Circe says to him, and this is really important because it introduces the theme of the whole next stage of the adventure, she says, I can't tell you what the best choice is for your route forward, but I can tell you what choices are in front of you so that you can decide, which is all that anybody can do. When you give advice to people, that's all you can ever do. You find out very quickly. You can't say to people, this is what you should do. It rarely ever works. But what you can say is you can describe the options before them so that they can have as clear a picture as possible of what to do. And then you can recommend one of those options. But the main thing about most choices, if you're struggling with a choice, is not to figure out what to do. It's to figure out what your options actually are. So that's what Circe is going to do for him. It's an enormous service. The first thing is he's going to have to go past the sirens. Now, the sirens, if you've seen paintings of the Odyssey. They probably involve the sirens that goes back to ancient vase painting would include depictions of this episode. It's a very visual story that the ancient word for this would be Enargea. You can picture it before your eyes. And there are a bunch, a bunch of paintings of this, but basically it's these seductresses with divine voices that are so enticing, so beautiful to listen to that any man who hears wants to pull up on their shores, but then they destroy you and their, their shores are littered with the bones of their victims. So bad call. You don't want to do that. So, sirens, very bad people. Don't go over there. Nasty women. They'll eat you alive, right? So you don't want to do that. So you have to stop your ears up with beeswax. But, says Circe, if you want to listen, you Odysseus, make sure that you are strapped, tied to the mast of your ship and de demand from your crew, order them, that even if you cry out, even if you long so much when you hear the song to, to be nearer to it, even so, they should just tie you up tighter. So that's the first set of 
challenges that they're going to face. And she again, she's just telling him his options. She says, if you want to hear it, here's how you do it. You can you could put your beeswax in your ears, but if you want, here's how you do it. Then she lays before him what actually amounts to like a decision tree, or it's kind of like one of those choose your own adventures. I don't know if you guys did those as a kid. When I was a kid, I used to do Goosebumps. I read like every Goosebumps book that R.L. Stein ever wrote. And there were some, most of them were just classic kind of scary stories, but there were some that were choose your own adventures, which meant that you would read up to a certain point and then it would say something like, there's a dark cellar door in front of you. If you go into the cellar, turn to page 50. If you lock the cellar up, turn to page 25, and the book will lead you on these different courses. And apparently they're now doing this on Netflix with like Black Mirrors, introducing these sort of choose your own adventure stories. I think they got almost replaced by video games. There are a lot of video games, like you think of Indigo Prophecy, where, where you do get different endings depending on how you play the game. But there are, there are, we all know something like this from, from our youth, I think. And this is what Circe lays before him, is this decision tree. Uh, it, we only remember the, the Scylla and Charybdis part because it's so famous, but the Scylla and Charybdis part is the last part of the decision tree. So it's the last of the options because he actually has a, a range of different possibilities, beginning with the wandering rocks. So the wandering rocks are these treacherous rocks that have destroyed everybody that sails past them, except for Jason and the Argonauts. And this is where we get another alternate hero story. Remember that the Odyssey is filled with all these other homecomings, all these other quests and adventures that happen embroidered around the periphery. And this is one very famous, Jason and the Argonauts. If you saw the old classic movie, I grew up with the classic movie about Jason and the and the Argonauts. Uh, but this is the old story that will eventually get retold by Apollonius of Rhodes, who's a much later epic poet in the Hellenistic era and in the community of scholars or in, at the Library of Alexandria. Um, now we get this brief reference that Hera loved Jason so much that she enabled him to survive the Wandering Rocks. But Circe says, do not recommend. In other words, if, unless you trust entirely in your divine protection, the Wandering Rocks are not your best option. So Odysseus does have divine favor from Athena. He is also under a divine curse from Poseidon. And Poseidon's territory is the sea, so he would be unwise. This would be a bad trade-off or a bad risk to take to go by the Wandering Rocks, which means instead he has to take another route, and that route opens up in turn into another decision tree. So the one branch goes off the Wandering Rocks, here's this other branch that goes away from the Wandering Rocks, and then branches off again into Scylla and Charybdis. And I described the choice with Scylla and Charybdis at the beginning of the episode. It's a giant whirlpool that sucks everything down, or it's Scylla. Now, Scylla is this monster. She's introduced here in the Odyssey. And all we really get is that she has many heads, that she will eat six men with six heads, and that she's always waiting for victims to, to travel past. She's this hideous, deformed beast. This has a long afterlife. And so if you've seen this story in poems, all we get in the Odyssey is that she's basically uh, an evil monster, hideous. She's got many heads. She's going to use those heads to chomp up at least six victims. And she's always waiting for people to travel past. So on the one hand is Charybdis, which is going to destroy everybody. But even if you don't get destroyed by Charybdis and you choose to steer closer to the cave of Scylla, you're still going to end up probably getting some guys eaten. And you have to face that fact. You can crawl, call out to Crateus, who is Scylla's mother, for protection. But probably you are out of luck. You probably, there's no way out of this without losing at least six of your few remaining men. There's only one ship left. And so this is a terrible loss. This is a high cost for Odysseus to pay. It would be a high cost anyway, but after they've been through so much together, to have to sacrifice six of them to get the rest home is a terrible choice, but it is the only way. And Odysseus is now called upon to face that choice and to take responsibility for his choice among the options. It falls to him. He is the leader. Just as you, when you have to make a difficult decision, are the person with whom the buck stops. You can solicit advice. You can ask people to help you understand your options. But at the end of the day, you can't blame other people for what you choose. So 
Odysseus can't blame Circe. He can't blame anything. This this is just the situation that he's in. These are the choices that he is is faced with. Now, down the line, there are going to be all sorts of backstories and fan fictions written about Scylla and how Scylla works because she is the main character, really, of this story. We get in Ovid's Metamorphoses, the Roman poet Ovid, who lived under the Emperor Augustus, writes about this backstory that actually Im implicates Circe in the whole problem. So the idea is that um, Scylla was initially a beautiful nymph and she was sought after. She, she was desired by another sort of sea deity. His name is Glaucus. He starts out as a fisherman, turns into a sea god, falls in love with Scylla, wants a love potion to make Scylla fall in love with him because she's still a hot babe. But Circe falls in love with Glaucus, so now you have this love triangle. And remember, Circe is sort of tricksy and deceptive, unless she really likes you or respects you. And instead, she pretends to give Glaucus a love potion, but it's actually this hideous transformation potion. And when Glaucus pours it into the pool where Scylla likes to bathe, it turns her into this deformed beast, and that's why she's this way. So Ovid kind of adds this twist on the story that nobody is innocent, that there's this implication of everybody kind of getting tied up in the in the web of bad choices that we all have before us. But even so, even still, we're ending up, the, you know, it doesn't change the reality before Odysseus, which is that he has to make this choice, he has to take responsibility for it. And it's only after getting through this whole gauntlet, only after facing up to this choice, that Odysseus is going to face the cattle of the sun. Because the next thing that happens is Circe repeats Tiresias' prophecy, retells the prophecy that we got in Book 11 from the Shades of the Underworld, that there's this, this island where the cattle of the sun god, Helios, are, are kept. And Helios loves these cattle. He likes to look at them as he travels over the earth, he says. And so if they're on that island, they must not kill and eat those cattle. So the challenge that they are ultimately going to face is, is that one. That's going to be their conclusive challenge. But now we see that that challenge in turn is going to be determined by all that went before it. So all the choices that are leading up to that moment are going to determine what happens there. Again, it's like a video game, right? It's like when you make a certain choice in, in one level and that changes the options available to you on the next level. And finally, you get to the end of the last cutscene, And what happens there depends on how you've done in the game, what you've chosen, what, what power-ups you've collected and so forth on the way. Or else it's kind of like I'm learning Python with my nephew right now, this coding language. Okay, this is really nerdy, but we're learning how to code and we're doing it together. I mean, he's much better at it than I am, but we're very, very slowly putting together this uh, basic working knowledge of, of code and how coding works. And in Python, everything operates through if-then statements because you first you assign truth values to these things that to these statements that are either true or false and you can it's kind of a you know binary choice that is works well with a computer and then you arrange these if then statements into true or false statements so you create this chain of knock on effects so if <laughs> if wandering rocks equals true and divine favor equals true then print survive elif or else if not then if <laughs> Wandering rocks equals true and divine favor equals false, then die, right? And then you kind of go through all these different possibilities. Each one affects the other. And once you've answered the first question, you move on to the second question and so on and, and so forth. And I think Odysseus fails this test. I think he falls short. And I don't think that we're supposed to feel better than him, but I do think Homer means for us to see this as one of Odysseus' greatest shortcomings that he's going to have to reckon with and atone for in the rest of his journey on, on his way home. Because ultimately, the cattle of the sun test goes terribly wrong. But it goes wrong in a way that is extremely revealing and carefully calibrated based on how Odysseus deals with the intractable problems that they have to face along the way. So here's why I think he fails. Here, here's the first thing that happens. I'm going to read to you now a passage that I've translated from book 12 in which Odysseus decides to relay what Circe has told him to his remaining crew. So we've got now like a story within a story within a story. We've got something that Odysseus is telling the Phaeacians that Circe told him and then he told his men. And that's important because 
now Homer is inviting us to think about the ways that different narrators represent the stories that they tell and the self-interest that we all bake into the stories we tell. Here's what Odysseus says. He says, Then I addressed my companions, of course, with a sorrowing heart. Oh, my friends, it's not right for just one or for only two men to know the divine revelations that heavenly Circe imparted to me. No, I will speak them aloud. See, isn't he such a good guy, right? He's passing on accountability. He's letting people know, being transparent as a leader. It's not right for just one person to be burdened with this knowledge of divine revelations. I'm going to speak them aloud so that whether we die or cheat death, we do both with eyes open and all of us know what perils we dodge. So he's basically telling the same thing that Circe told him. You're going to know, you know what the options are and we're going to be aware. Eke thenomen, eke aleo amanoi thanaton, kaikeru fugomen, eidotes. We will do it knowingly. With it. Whether we cheat, die or cheat death, we do both with eyes open and all of us know what perils we dodge. The sirens first. She insisted we steer away from the sound of their God's sweet voices, away from their blossom-studded shores. Only I should listen, she said, but in bondage. You will hold me back with painful straps that will give me no choice but to stay upright at the foot of the mast, which you'll use to secure the ties. And if I should beg you or give you orders to set me free, then you bring more rope and you use it to lash me in tighter bonds. Okay, so there is a clue here that Odysseus is not being entirely forthright. Maybe you caught it. Remember when I told you what Circe said to him? Circe says to him, if you want to listen to the sirens, here's how you do it. You can stop your ears up with beeswax, but if you want to open yourself up to this challenge, here's how you do it safely, as safely as possible. Odysseus, though, says, only I should listen. A no gay. She told me to do this. Circe told me to do this. He's kind of passing off responsibility to Circe, and he's saying that only I should listen, just as he said that it's not right that only I should have this knowledge. So he wants other people besides himself. It's extremely human. He wants other people besides himself to be responsible for decision-making and choice in this terrible moment. Now, this is inc incredibly sympathetic and relatable. I, I'm not saying here that this is where Odysseus reveals himself to be a scoundrel or anything like that. In fact, I'm saying that this is where he shows his human failings that we can all relate to. He wants to pass off responsibility so badly that he's telling them untruths about how Circe talked to him. He's misreporting this story. And that's why it's so important what he says next, because the next line, right, told him all about the sirens, which remember is the first stage, and this it's the trunk of the decision tree. It's the beginning of, of this series of, of challenges they're going to face. Yes, I informed my companions of each and every point. E toi ego ta hekasta legon, hetai roisi pifauskon. Hekasta means each and every one. And technically, I suppose you could say, this is true, because he told them each and every stage along the way of that journey up to the point of the sirens. He filled them in on all of those details. He tweaked some of those details. He made a little bit of change here and there, but he definitely did hit all the points and then he stopped. And he did not, in fact, tell them each and every point about what would come next. He skipped over. And in fact, later on, he says, I skipped over the, the whole matter of, of Scylla because it would simply be pointless. It's a, a, a prekton anien. It's a pointless and unavoidable grief. Scylla, I left for the moment, a grief unspoken, pointless to mention and unavoidable. When they're already right up against this challenge, all the way up, he leaves this unspoken. And so now we have some questions. At least I have some questions, right? Does, does he... One option, I suppose, is that he's not telling the whole thing to Alcinous. But he did tell them more than he gives us here. So in order to avoid needless repetition, he's cutting out a whole bunch of other stuff that he did say to the men. And he's just summarizing it with, I told them each and every point. But that's not possible for a couple reasons. First of all, he says later on that he's keeping the most important thing from them, which is Scylla, which means that some of them are going to have to die, right? Scylla is the crux of the matter because Scylla means that they are, they're not all going to get out of this alive. So he's definitely withholding at least that from them. Also, and this is where Homer is more than just a conventional artist, 
It's totally normal for long speeches to be repeated in epic poetry. It's part of the oral tradition when they spoke these poems or sang these poems aloud. Part of how they kept them in their memories is they would memorize chunks like the speech that Tiresias makes about the Cattle of the Sun, and then somebody else, some other character, would repeat them so that you get the audience on board, the audience knows important information, hears it repeated, and the singer can catch his breath and think and have chunks that he's able to kind of trot out each time. That's just happened. Circe has just talked about the Cattle of the Sun, repeating the message that we already got in, in Book 11. So we know that this is a really important moment we're building up to, and that act of repetition serves another purpose for Homer, which is, is here in this book, so that we know he's not afraid of repetition. And that reminds us that's a thing that people do. So if Odysseus had wanted to go on and repeat all the stuff about Scylla and Charybdis and tell them all of that, he certainly could have, but he doesn't. He keeps it from them. So why does he say, I told them each and every point? Well, is he claiming, is he misrepresenting himself to Alcinous and hoping that people won't notice? I told them each, I told them everything, everything they needed to know and hoping that the Phaeacians and therefore by proxy us, we, we won't, notice this and we'll just think, oh, he's such a good guy, he wanted to be transparent, he wanted to be accountable. Or, and this is perhaps the saddest thought of all, can he not bear to face it himself? Oh, just there's no reason to tell them about this. There's no point in telling them about this. And, and that's what he says, right? It's a pointless, it would, be, it would be helpless, useless to tell them about this. And yet, and yet, these men who have been through it all, whom he claims to respect enough to invite them to make their choices with eyes wide open, to go to death or to survive or to escape death, either way, knowing what they do, at this crucial moment he has held back. And I think this is a, a failure of, of leadership. He's failing to take responsibility for the choice that he has to make. It's a terrible choice. It's an awful choice. And it's not one that any one of us would be happy to make. And yet, in order to make even those choices effectively, you have to face up to what the options are and be honest with yourself about which options you're choosing from and what choice you're making and why. If Odysseus had made the choice to keep the whole thing from them, that would be one possibility, one trade-off. I'm not going to trust them. I'm not going to gain their trust. I'm going to risk losing their trust in order to shoulder the whole burden of this in silence. That's a trade-off. That's a risk because they might lose some trust in, in him, but it would be an honest choice. Or he could tell them everything and risk them blaming him. They, they might react the way that sometimes we react when somebody faces us with an impossible choice. We blame the messenger, the person that brings us that terrible choice and confronts us with that. So that would be a risk that he would take upon himself in order to be completely forthright and transparent with them. And that too would, would be honest and would be a trade-off. But what he does is something dishonest, even to himself. He hides it within this web of lies and, and self-deception within a certain degree of branding and rhetoric and, and careful kind of positioning and, and, and rewriting of the story. And this, I think, is why the Cattle of the Sun episode goes wrong. Because it is about to go wrong, and we don't get any, nobody ever said, gives us a moral of the story about it or anything, but I think this is why the, the, the Cattle of the Sun goes wrong. Because watch what happens next. So they take the whole journey, they are able to withstand the sirens, they do exactly what Odysseus tells them, straps him to the trap him to the mast, put beeswax in their ears, yoke him tighter and tighter. The more he cries out, to exactly as as he describes. It. In fact, it's another repetition because there's a lot of repetitions in this book again to remind you to think about how things change when they get repeated, so that you can notice what happens, what Odysseus does. Very very subtle and, and careful kind of artistic craft and construction. But then they end up making the choice that they really have to make. It is the right choice here. The right choice is to minimize your casualties, to cut your losses by sailing near Scylla. It's just that it comes at an unacceptable cost. It's a terrible price to pay for this correct trade-off. And my friends, it do be like that sometimes, right? This isn't anybody's fault, really, except maybe Scylla's for being such a monstrous fiend. But it is and, and perhaps, you know, if you want to blame people that got us here, you could blame Circe for creating Scylla, if you believe that version of the story. You could blame Odysseus for getting us in this mess in the first place by challenging Poseidon. I mean, all sorts of things have happened to, to get us to this point. But once you're here, it's nobody's fault they have to face it. It's just that they have to face it. They really have to be aware of what's going on. And the moment when I think we realize it was a mistake not to warn them 
is the moment of death because we have a, a, a scene. I haven't really read through some of the gorier scenes from Homer, and, and I'm going to fix that now because we have really one of the most horrifying uh, horror movie level description of this moment when six of six heads dart down from Scylla's cliff and devour six men, six of the strongest men. So here again, I'm, I'm translating for you, book 12. Then Scylla reached down into my hollow ship and picked off six companions. She chose the bravest and strongest in hand and in heart. In that moment, I looked at the rushing ship and I saw my friends, their hands and their feet already dangling high above me, snatched away. They were moaning and wailing and calling aloud to me, calling me by my name one final time in their sorrow. Three different words for crying out, and the last one, extremely unusual, extraordinary, and calling our attention, very long word. Thengonto, they were making noise. Keleontes, calling out. Exonomakledain, calling on me by my name. And so we get this piteous moment, Odysseus, we trusted you, and you led us into your death. Save us now. And like a fisherman stands with his spear on a jutting crag. One of these classic Homeric simile moments. This is peak Homer, where you are in the midst of the action, and suddenly, out of nowhere, host hotepi probolo. Suddenly you, you transition, the scene shifts, and we don't even really quite know where we are, but it, it builds into this ominous, terrible Mo image and like a fisherman stands with his spear on a jutting crag tossing chum as a trick in the water to lure the little fish then lowers a field-fed ox's horn down into the sea and yanks them out of the water to lay them gasping on land so my men were hauled away gasping and writhing toward the cliff at the mouth of her cave, she devoured them all as they shrieked in pain and stretched out their hands to me in their gruesome and gory death throes. Of all the heart-wrenching sights that has passed before my eyes, this was the saddest I've suffered on all the paths of the sea. So he says outright, this is the saddest thing I've ever seen. This is the worst sight that has ever passed before my eyes on all the suffering paths of the sea. And... The whole point of Odysseus is he is the suffering man. He's the sufferer. And for him to say this is to acknowledge that something has gone terribly wrong. Something has been broken deeply. And I think it was in that moment that he realized he had not respected his men enough to tell them what they were facing. And to invite, if he was going to invite them into this choice, he, he should have done them the honor of allowing them to go willingly and die like men. That's what he said he was going to do. He said, I'm going to tell you so that we can die knowingly or unknowingly. And he didn't do that. Now, Odysseus has had a long journey when it comes to honesty, when it comes to telling the truth versus lying and, and using his skill of trickery, which is a word that comes up in that simile when the fisherman is tossing chum into the sea. It's a dolos. It's a trick. Odysseus is a man of many, many tricks. He's polytropos. He's good at using his words. He's good at deceiving. We've seen that in the Cyclops episode. We've also seen over the course of this whole poem that he has matured and he's taken a journey, which is dif difficult to spot if you only pay attention book by book. But if you pull back the camera, you realize stretching all the way back to the Iliad, there was a time when Odysseus would use rhetoric for those he respected and beat everybody else he didn't. There's a scene in the Iliad where Odysseus has to convince people to go back to their ranks, and he walks through, and he, every upright man, every noble man he talks to, speaks to with kind words and gentle thoughts, and every low-born fellow he beats over the head and sends him back. He has matured in this way, and I think the beginning of his maturation process, we can trace back to the moment with the bag of winds from Aeolus. Do you remember this episode? So Aeolus, keeper of the winds, gave him this bag of winds to keep all the winds except the favorable one. And he gave it to his crew. And he said, watch over this. Even if I'm sleeping, don't open it. You got one job, right? They suspected him of hiding loot from them, which tells you something about how they regard him. They were serving him, perhaps out of fear, perhaps out of wartime necessity. But now that that's over, all sorts of submerged questions start to bubble up about Odysseus' trustworthiness and whether he is a leader that men should die for, should listen to. And it's in that disastrous moment that they open the bag of winds and now they are doomed to way, way more wandering. And it's because of the men, 
It's their mistake, but it's also because of Odysseus. And every leadership failure is both a failure of the people following, but ultimately it also redounds back on the leader. And it's because of who Odysseus is. It's because he's a trickster and because he's known for his self-interest, because he's able to get people to do what he wants by manipulating them that they don't trust him. And I think after that moment, we start gradually to see a bond forming, trust building back up between Odysseus and his remaining men, that they start to trust him as he gets them out of more and more situations, but he has to earn that trust back. And famously, of course, broken trust is the hardest thing to rebuild, but he does. He rebuilds it through the Cyclops episode. He rebuilds it, I think, in Circe's, on Circe's island when he comes to save his men from their enchantment. The fact that he goes back for them, even though I guess he could just flee. There's, there's trust forming, and ultimately he ends up with a, a small remnant crew that would follow him even into hell, because they do. They literally follow him to converse with the souls of the dead. And so he's built that trust back up, and he's, he should be able now to include them into his circle of intimacy. But he can't. And he can't for a very understandable veteran kind of reason, which is once you get locked into your wartime mentality, which for Odysseus is a mentality of caginess and survival tactics and expediency and dishonesty if it gets the job done, ends that justify the means, right? He can't think his way all the way out of that to be fully open with this select crew. And if you can't be fully open even with your closest companions, even with your comrades, then you can't truly be yourself. You can't have an identity unless there are some intimates that you open yourself up to. You shouldn't open yourself up to everybody about everything. You shouldn't just post on the internet about your terrible failings and all your psychoses or, or whatever. You want you do actually want, you know, nowadays we have this idea of authenticity. You should just say what's ever on your mind. No, you want you want to be put together and composed in public, but you also want to be able to open up in your raw moments. And this is surely a raw moment to be facing this leadership challenge for Odysseus and almost, you know, faced with, with intractable tragedy that he has to invite his men into. This should have been a moment when he could have respected them enough to let them in, and he didn't. And now they've died in the most pitiable way possible, and he's racked with that regret, and his men have lost that, that trust for him. He's broken that bond of trust again, which he built up for so, so long. And so when I say that this poem is a carefully constructed literary masterpiece, I literally mean it's reaching back into the Iliad, bringing forth a problem that we saw in Odysseus' character that was unsolved, unresolved, because of the way that the, that war had to go. Now that problem has been laid bare, has caused a disaster, there's been growth and movement, but it's not enough. And that terrible last loss is what Odysseus is going to have to now suffer when they reach the much anticipated climactic moment of the cattle of the sun. Because here, so here they go, they get to the island of Helios, his men are beaten down, but even still they're ready to listen to him. They're, they're ready to, um, to follow him until he says, we're, we're not going onto that island. And, and now we get the first open insurrection, open insubordination. And it comes from Eurylochus. And this is a, a hard blow because Eurylochus has kind of been Odysseus' right-hand man. He was selected by Lot to go at, in the advance guard into Circe's chambers. He came back and brought the news of what had happened to Odysseus. And, and there's a disaster of credibility here, a crisis of confidence, because Odysseus has said, you know, we, we're, we, we don't have to put ashore on this island, and we shouldn't. We should just avoid the cattle of the sun altogether. Eurylochus says, maybe you can survive that, but you have to listen to us now. And Odysseus, I think, is now a broken man. He's a broken-spirited man, and he's lost all confidence, and he can't fight back. All these men have accused him of making the wrong decisions, of thinking about himself, and he has seen how his own failures have been fatal for those in his charge. And I, I think uh, in another world, he would totally fight back against this mutiny, against the people having the gall to stand up to their king, their leader. He'd beat him over the head with a stick, I'm sure. But he's not that guy anymore. And that's part of his journey. That's a good thing. But he hasn't crossed all the way over to the other side yet to become the other guy, to be the guy that you can trust and who can let his men into his 
confidence, and so he's lost, and he just has to throw up his hands and say, "Well, I can't, I can't fight you all, and I, what right do I have really anymore to stand on my own authority? So we'll have to put ashore." He says, "At least don't eat these these beautiful, delicious looking beasts. We've got food on ship. We've got food at home, right?" But there's a storm. And the storm keeps them, the the wind keeps them from leaving for a month. And finally, Eurylochus steps up and Eurylochus does what Odysseus can't do. That is, he faces the choice in front of them. He says, it's better to die through the vengeance of the gods, to be killed for eating these cattle, than it is to die by starvation. And he says, you know, whether he's right about this or or wrong, I think he he probably is, is right, he says, we're going to die here. Let's take our death into our own hands. Let's have, let's have a feast. Let's try at least to propitiate the gods. Let's try to sacrifice to them and hope that they can, can avert their wrath from us. Um, but the Greek gods, as we know, are, are not all that forgiving. And in fact, what happens is they choose to eat. They choose to, to be killed by Zeus, and Zeus blasts them and destroys their ship, and it's Odysseus left alone with the guilt of that, with the sorrow of having failed to retain his men's trust, failed to face the choices before him, and failed ultimately even to make the right decision when when he was left thrown upon this last crisis moment of the cattle of of the sun. It was Eurylochus who had to step into that power void because Odysseus is out of commission. He's just kind of lost, I think, his confidence and and his bravado, and and he's he's in a crisis. He's in a crisis of identity and a crisis of, um, of, of leadership. And there is just something so sad to me about this, but also artistically so right that this is where Odysseus has to end up. And and it is here that he ends up washing on the shore of Ajaja, Calypso's island, and spending years with, with Calypso. And it's a very, very different, you know, we talked about spending the year he spent with Circe and kind of his love affair with Circe. But with Calypso, it's it's something quite different. It's almost like Calypso has to build him back up. And he has to recover, essentially, from, from what is now the end of his, of his journey. I mean, it's kind of all over but the shouting, right? Like, he's now f- rooted out the last failure of character. And it's a very, very painful thing. And it comes at the expense of the deaths of many people. And it, there's nothing that's going to make that okay. It's not like, oh, good, Odysseus comes back better. And so it's fine that all these hundreds of men died. It's just that that was... The situation that's that's how it happened that's how the story unfolded and it does remind me i mean obviously hopefully we don't you know so fall down on our responsibilities as to like you know cause the deaths of people but sometimes there are problems with our character or flaws that we have to face that we don't even know that we have there's a psalm cleanse me from hidden faults and usually if you pray that prayer it's a dangerous prayer because you will end up being confronted with your faults in, in a way that kind of shocks you out of your complacency. And I think that's what has happened to Odysseus here. It's where the last vestiges of his soldier self have to be stripped away from him in order that he can come home. And that's what we're going to turn towards next, is we're going to turn towards his journey back home. And and I think it's on his journey back home that Odysseus finally finds the right combination of deception caginess, wariness, cleverness, canniness, and this new vulnerability, openness, trust, which he's going to have to bestow in his son and his wife in order to finish the job, in order to make it finally to the end of his journeys. And so we are going to turn to that and to happier things, although there's still lots of bloodshed and gore to come. But we have effectively reached now the verge of our destination. We've been on this journey now for weeks and weeks. I, I, I've i loved doing it with you. We started way back with the pre-story to the Iliad. So we've gotten two Homeric poems now. We're really reaching the verge of, of the end of the Odyssey. And it was in order to prepare ourselves for a movie that's coming out later about this part, about the return home. And we will talk about that movie when it comes out. We'll also talk about another great work of art once we've finished this one. I've really loved... I, keep your suggestions coming. I, I think... Right now, the the leader for the vote of what we should do next is the Aeneid, which is another epic poem. And I think I will pick that. I definitely will pick that one up at some point. We might do a couple other shorter things along the way in between now and then. 
but I, if you're if you're writing to me about the Aeneid, about doing the Aeneid, I've I've heard you. A lot of a lot of people have have suggested the Aeneid, so I'm looking forward to doing that with you. But if you can think of a short work that you'd like to do in between, a few short things, I, I might kind of visit for a couple weeks with a few other things. But we've still got a, a little bit of Odyssey to go. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast, and thank you so much to all of you who have bought my book, Light of the Mind, Light of the World. Um, it's been selling great, like beyond my wildest dreams. And, you know, that sounds crass and sales are one thing, you know, but sales mean that people are reading the book. And for an author to hear from people that are reading their work, his work, is is just, I mean, it's it's why you do it, right? Is for you to open that book at some in some moment when you're not sure about something or you're wondering about something and, and to meet another voice that can speak clarity into your mind. That's why, at least why I write books. And so I love to hear from you guys who have bought the book. If you haven't already, there's still copies available, Light of the Mind, Light of the World, buy it on Amazon. And I have one favor, last favor to request from those of you that have bought the book and have been enjoying it. Um, if you are, are reading Light of the Mind, Light of the World, I would really be grateful if you would give it a five-star review on Amazon. And again, it's not because of the metrics or whatever. It's because this is a means to an end. If you give the book a five-star review, if you write just a sentence or two about how it has helped you or what's been good about it for you, and you give it five stars, that will boost it and allow other people to find it and to reach new readers and, and for other folks to get their hands on it would just be a, a, a blessing to me. And I hope that it would also be helpful to them, that the, this book is about how to break free of a narrative that we are all, to a certain extent, trapped inside of. This this narrative that the world is just a machine and that maybe we're just primitive animals and we're destined to be replaced or whatever. That narrative has taken hold so many places that people need breaking free of it. And I think this book is, is a way, a route out to see that science actually can point us toward a better, fuller vision of the world, one that looks more like the vision proposed in the Hebrew and uh, Greek scriptures. And yeah, I would just love for more people to read it. So if you could give the book five stars, I, I would so, so appreciate it. Thank you uh, for those of you that have already done it, for those of you that bought the book. Uh, let's keep this thing going. Okay, mailbag questions. So mailbag questions come to me on Substack at rejoiceevermore.substack.com. That's the best way to get in touch with me these days. You can DM me. You can answer my Friday emails that I send out. You can become a paid subscriber if that's something that sounds appealing to you. It would certainly be helpful and, and uh, a blessing to me. Um, but all of this is available at rejoiceevermore.substack.com, and it's also where you can ask questions. So I got a question from Stephen, and Stephen has written a very Halloween-appropriate question, so I decided to answer it today, since this is, I think, the last, maybe the second to last episode before I will, uh, before Halloween that I, that I will release. We've got one more episode before Halloween, maybe we'll do some other spooky stuff. But this is a, an, a question about body horror, and I've actually been watching some body horror movies recently. I, I watched the uh, Night of the Living Dead, which I thought was the original. There's a 1968 original, black and white, Night of the Living Dead. And I, I went on Amazon to search for it and found a movie that was labeled 1968, Night of the Living Dead, and watched it. And halfway through, I'm like, this is in color. Isn't the original in black and white? And it turns out it was mislabeled. So I watched a different Night of the Living Dead, but it's, it was still pretty good. And it was all about zombies which I didn't realize are actually initially a, a voodoo thing. They're, they're kind of a superstition from voodoo lore. But it became this iconic story, and, and Night of the Living Dead sort of spawned the zombie movie, the original one, that I did not succeed in watching. But here's what Stephen asks. He says, In the spirit of the spooky season, it seems to me that body horror ought to be the perfect genre for exploring the dual nature of man. I've talked before about hylomorphism, which is this idea that man is two things in one all the time and everywhere, body and a soul. And the book, Light of the Mind, is a lot about this. It's about the fact that it's not as if there's some ghost in the machine. It's not like there's some jelly or paste floating around that we call God. It's that every material particle of the world is simultaneously a vessel for spiritual reality, that mind and matter have to meet in order for reality to exist. And you can't just have raw matter sitting around if you did, there, nothing would move, nothing would exist, there'd be no form in the world, our language would mean nothing, like all the things that we assume make it necessary that there be a consciousness in, at least a consciousness in the world, and probably many consciousnesses, many souls. 
And so he's Stephen is saying that there ought to be a whole genre of, of movies about this problem. But all the body horror stories I can think of seem to be wholly uninterested in the hylomorphic union. Movies like The Fly, Tusks, Human Centipede seem to be strictly materialistic and make no mention of the soul. The rest of horror seems to hold the ghost piloting a neat suit perspective of philosophical anthropology. So Stephen is basically saying, like, why horror movies require you, essentially, to think about the human body, dead bodies, right, and what makes a body dead versus alive. So this should be peak soul hours. This should be when you start thinking about and talking about souls. But we don't. We instead kind of just talk about human bodies as if they were, as if they were meat. And here's my reflection based on just having watched this zombie movie, Night of the Living Dead. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about the ghost story as a legitimate art form which conveys our sense that there is more to life than the body and there is more to life than what ends at death. When the, when the body dies and we, the body goes under the ground, there's something else that persists. And so anytime you feel that chill of horror that says like, oh, the world is very different from what I expected, this is something that Lewis says kind of hints at us that there's more to the world. We live in this particular era where there is, we're, we don't think about that. We, we're, we're sort of, in hawk, we're in, in, in enslaved, really, to materialism, right? And we have this idea that there is no soul, there's nothing in the body except the body, and so when the body dies, it dies and decomposes and rots. I think that much of our horror is about what a terrible idea that is. It's sort of a subconscious way of addressing the fact that if the body is just this living animal that lives according to material atomic rules and then dies and decomposes, this is actually very horrifying. That it's, it, it's a disgusting idea that this thing which we are, which we all feel and know to be transcendent, can be food for worms. And this has always been a source of anxiety and horror, but it's, it's particularly horrific if you think that the worm food is the reality and the soul is just a fantasy then we really do live in a world where our flesh is this kind of clay puppet or something. And I actually read a leftist book recently called All Things Are Too Small that has a long essay in it about the fly, a horror movie in which a guy turns into a fly and talks about it as kind of a positive metamorphosis, like this is liberating yourself from the constraints of the body and, and hurling yourself off into this new, untold, open, vast expanse and is sort of a, a, an act of liberation. I think that's because... The idea of getting free of your form, if you're a materialist, is just rearranging the meat that you are. And the fact that that disgusts us inherently, that we can't get over our disgust for it, is what we're brooding over in these horror movies like Night of the Living Dead, which is all about bodies without souls. It's all about these dead husks of what was once humanity, and the fact that they still seem to carry something more than their meat, right? The fact that they are animated or that they're occupied by some sort of ghost presence or some virus or something that drives them to become something hideous, I think that is our subconscious way of dealing with the fact that our materialism is actually a deadening and degrading and disgusting unhuman philosophy. So we're, we're unable to escape in our horror movies our suspicion that there's more to life than... than the body, even though we believe in our minds that there's more to life than the body. The guy that you really have to watch if you want to get a grip on this is Mike Flanagan, who makes these remakes of beautiful old ghost stories like The Haunting of Hill House. There's one called The Haunting of Bly Manor, which is a take on The Turn of the Screw. There's one based on a bunch of Edgar Allan Poe's. They're mostly um, Netflix series, and, and he releases them around Halloween. And He's such a skilled filmmaker, but his stories always end up with people saying, you know, there is no God, the body is just electrons. I mean, there's one called Midnight Mass that ends with a speech about how we just dissolve back into this e electron sea and the consciousness is just matter knowing itself. It's very His Dark Materials. Except that there are real vampires in that story and there are real demons all over Mike Flanagan's universe. And so in order to tell the story of the spooky world, which we all sense that there is the uncanny in the world and there is spookiness in the world, Flanagan has to basically depict a situation in which God isn't real, but hell and Satan are. 
which is a diabolical vision of the world and is actually a disgusting and d terrible thing that we should, be, that should fill us with despair. But we always try to kind of pass it off as like, yes, we just end up returning to the great cosmic sea. And it's like, well, okay, so then the world is just human meat being devoured by demons forever. Like, that's what it is. And, and that's what these stories that you're talking about all are. Human centipede, the fly, tusks, and, and so forth. And so... This is a question from, from Stephen that goes on. He says, the only stories I can think of that get close are Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a uh, picture of Dorian Gray, which are about the consequences for moral action and printing themselves on your body. But even for these stories, I'm stretching to say they're about the hylomorphic union. Can you think of any stories that feature the relationship between the body and the soul, especially any horror stories? Well, I have kind of answered this question just to say that I think all horror stories feature that relationship whether we want them to or not there are many great ghost stories that are about that i think you know the uncanny and you know if you if you want a list of the greatest ghost stories what you have to do is go to the new jerusalem.substack.com that's where my dad and i have this substack where we write back and forth to each other and my dad is the master reader of, of ghost stories and he quotes that c.s lewis piece in one of his recent list articles where he gives you i think six maybe seven of the best ghost stories to read for halloween so i would commend that to you and unfortunately that means i have to tell you to become a paid subscriber at the new jerusalem but you should anyway it's worth it you'll like it um new jerusalem.substack.com happy halloween everybody hope you have enjoyed this journey onward with odysseus and i look forward to picking it up with you next week uh one more time just Please do order Light of the Mind, Light of the World. Give it five stars on Amazon if you haven't already. Send in any mailbag questions, any suggestions you may have for future episodes, things to do in between Homer and Virgil at rejoiceevermore.substack.com. And that's it for me this week. I will see you next time for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.